This is an example of working the medium level or level 2 problems in the inverse Laplace transforms tutorial in Circuit Tutor. As always, we have examples available at a variety of levels of difficulty. And so if you're unsure about how to work these problems after watching, of course, the introductory tutorial, which would um, show you the basic methods, um, you can certainly view an unlimited supply here of different uh, problems. So here's one, for example, where we have an exponential function of s preceding a rational function, or ratio of uh, terms, basically, uh, polynomials. And that indicates that we need a time-shifting property. So we would use the time-shifting property um, and then compute the inverse transform of this using partial fractions. So we expand that as a standard partial fractions type thing over those two poles at negative 1 and negative 6 both in units of inverse seconds. And then we could use the method of residues, um, otherwise known as the thumb method, to basically compute each of those coefficients in the partial fractions uh, expansion. And then form the partial fraction expansion, take the inverse transforms using the standard uh, inverse transform function for an exponential, the transform pair rather. And then we can also apply the time shifting uh, to that result. So we replace t by t minus 5 in this case because it was an e to the negative 5s. So that would illustrate how to work that problem. And you also have the option here to select user selected examples, which would allow you to pick different types, such as, for example, simple poles or complex conjugate poles. Um, and you could include the exponential factor, the time shifting in there if you want. So that's another way of viewing examples in this exercise. Okay, so let's go ahead and work the medium level problems. So here's the first problem. And again, you do see that we have this exponential function of s, which indicates that we have a time shifting factor present. So as it shows you here, we basically want to uh, multiply or factor out basically e to the negative uh, 9s so that we write that as e to the negative 9s times a new function f of s. And then the f of s will be whatever multiplied the exponential, obviously. So that'll be this. And so, again, it's always important uh, people want to rush ahead and enter the time domain value here. That's not what's being requested. And as with any problem, it's important to look at what's being requested because if you enter something different, then that would not be accepted. So here we want the partial fraction expansion of this. And that requires we have several uh, terms. So we're, we're not using the exponential function um, just yet. So since we're entering a partial fraction expansion, or an f of s, we need to be in the Laplace domain, not in the time domain, where the functions are functions, of course, of time, or t. So we go into the Laplace domain tab on the equation entry system here. And then we realize that um, in order to do partial fraction expansions, we're going to need two separate fractions, including s plus a terms in the denominator. So I'll put in a fraction term. And then I'll add to that and put another fraction term. And then in each numerator of the fraction, I will have a constant. So I'll put a, a real constant there, as opposed to, say, the complex constant here in, in uh, rectangular or polar form. And then I need an s plus a type term in each denominator. So I'll just drag that down into there and drag that down into there. And again, if you ever put the wrong term in there, you can just remove it like that um, and then put the correct term in place. But in this case, it was correct. So you can drag anything out of this area if you need to uh, replace it. So the a values here will be 3 and 8 respectively, as you can see immediately from the fraction here. And then we need to determine the constants in the numerator. So again, what we're trying to do is to have values here such that when we put this over a common denominator that we will recover um, this expression um, as a result. So in order to do that, we're going to use the method of residues, otherwise known maybe as the thumb method, where we basically multiply, for example, to determine this coefficient, I'm going to multiply the entire equation by s plus 3, and then set s equal to negative 3. So that will leave us, um, as a result of the multiplication, just with the uh, constant of interest here. Over here, I'm going to have an s plus 3 in the numerator. And when I set s equal to negative 3, that means I multiply this by 0, so that goes away. And I'm left with nothing but the constant I want on the right-hand side, which is, of course, desirable. And then going back here, I see that if I multiply through this by s plus 3, 
then that's going to cancel that term and leave me with negative 10 over s plus 8. And then as I set s equal to negative 3, I'm going to have negative 3 plus 8, which is just 5. And I have negative 10 then divided by 5, which would be negative 2. So that would be the first constant would be a negative 2 here. Then I can do the same process for the second coefficient. So I'll multiply through by s plus 8 and set s equal to negative 8. That will isolate this constant here and then give us 0 here when I set the s equal to negative 8. That just multiplies this by 0. So here when I multiply by s plus 8 on the left hand side, then that cancels this s plus 8, which we could just put our finger over that or something if we wish. And then we set s equal to negative 8. So I'll have negative 8 plus 3. That's going to be negative 5. So then I have negative 10 divided by negative 5, which is just now going to be a positive 2. So I'll put a 2 here. And that should complete this uh, partial fraction expansion for the f of s. Again, we're not including the exponential now because that was part of g of s. Okay, so that is correct. And now um, we're going to take the inverse transform of the g of s where g of s includes the exponential factor. And remember that uh, f of s is a part of g of s as we noted up here. So now we are in fact going to be in the time domain because we want g of t. So we need to go to the time domain palette, but also remember because we are we have that exponential factor that isn't going to introduce time shifting in our result. So for the time shifted uh, terms, we need to go to this particular palette, this middle palette, where everything is shifted um, as a function of time. And so now we're going to need basically um, two exponential functions, but they have to be time shifted exponential functions. Now I could use this term here, for example. Um, where I multiply everything by a unit step function that's also time shifted and then fill in the blanks inside that brackets. Um, instead I'm going to use separate terms here just for convenience. So first of all we will need a, a constant term times a time shifted exponential which will be this term and then we need a uh, time shifted u of t function. So I'm just going to put that in. Then I'll add to that a second term which will be of the same form so I have a constant a real constant times the time shifted exponential times the u of t again I have to remember to put in those u of t functions in order to be correct now the time shifting value uh, comes from the argument of the exponential and again if you aren't sure about that you could pull up the Laplace transform properties here where this would show you um, the time shifting property here this is the formula that we're basically using and that's always available for reference here on this tab or you could pull that up in a separate window if you wanted to have it side by side with your problem. Um, but here I'll just remember that I need the time shifting by an amount of 9 seconds. So I'm going to put in t minus 9 in each of those arguments there and that would include here and that's t minus 9 and u of t minus 9. Okay then the first coefficient would be that negative 2 And then I have, um, because the inverse transform of, of uh, 1 over s plus 3 is just e to the negative 3t. And again, if you don't remember that transform, that's a really good one to know. But if you don't remember it, you could look that up in the Laplace transform table, which is available here. And that would be this third entry in the table. It tells us the inverse transform of 1 over s plus a is just e to the negative at u of t. But again, I do recommend actually memorizing these first three entries because they're used so frequently. Okay, so um, there we have the s plus 3, so that's going to be e to the negative 3t. And then uh, in the second term, which is this one now, I have a coefficient of 2. And now it's going to be e to the negative 8t because the a here in the s plus a is 8. So we have e to the negative 8t. And that should complete um, the answer here. So I'll go ahead and check that. And that is correct. And then that will give me a brief summary um, of the steps that I did. And if you, for any reason, want to view a more detailed solution um, to go over the steps, if you're uncertain about anything, then you can always click that button and that will show it fully worked as if it were a, uh, basically a, an example. Okay, so that completed the first problem. Now let's do another problem at the medium level, which will be of a different type. So now, um, I don't have any exponential function this time, so I don't need to worry about the time shifting property. 
but I do notice that I'm being given a quadratic term here in the denominator. Now, um, that's one that's going to be probably factorizable, and I could check the uh, discriminant, for example, the b squared minus 4ac, so that would be 16 squared is 256, minus the 4ac, that would be uh, 256 minus 240. So I see that that's going to be a positive number. Again, the, the c here is 60, the a is 1, of course, because uh, it's 1s squared. So 256 minus 240 is positive, so I know that that's going to have real roots. Um, so therefore, um, we'll just use a quadratic formula uh, to find that. And um, so I'm going to do that on a, a calculator here uh, rather than writing it on a paper. So our A is 1, our B is 16, and our C is 60 in the standard quadratic formula. Now I like to use the formula where we have negative B over the quantity 2A. So that would be negative 16 over just 2 because the a is 1. So that would be negative 8. So I'm just going to enter a negative 8 here. And then I'll generally have plus or minus, but of course I have to evaluate on the calculator one at a time. So I'll use the plus sign. And now I'm going to have the square root using the quadratic formula here. And this is using a TI-84 plus emulator. Um, plus the square root of the negative b over 2a quantity squared. So it'll be the same thing, same thing squared. And of course, I don't really need the minus sign since I'm squaring it. So I'll just enter it as 8 squared, although it's really negative 8 quantity squared. Um, so I'll have 8 squared. Um, and then minus the c over a. So c is 60 and a is 1. So that will be minus 60. And now I'll just enter that. And that gives me one root as being negative 6. Now to get the second root, I'm just going to go back up and grab that same formula and just modify it slightly. So I'll go back over here to the plus sign and make that a minus sign. Avoid retyping all of that. And enter that. And that gives me the other root, which is negative 10. And of course, if you want to check that those are the roots, just plug both of those numbers into here. So I could have negative 6 quantity squared would be 36. Um, and then you could compute this and add to 60, and you find that indeed that adds to 0. And similarly with the negative 10, it would be 100 uh, minus 160 plus 60, and obviously that will be 0 also. So you can check that those are in fact the valid roots. Okay, so um, it's asking you to actually rewrite the function here after factoring the quadratic terms in numerator and or denominator. Here we only have one in the denominator. So remember that this is not asking you for the final value in the time domain at this point. It's asking you just to basically factor the quadratic term. So it's taking you through step by step. And it's important to pay attention to what is being asked for because if you enter something that's not being asked for, such as the final answer to the problem, even if you enter the correct final answer, you're not going to get credit because that's not what it's asking you for. So let's go and go on the Laplace domain. And we're going to need a fraction there to enter that and a constant in the numerator. And then we're going to need two s plus a terms in the denominator. In the denominator, rather. Oops. And so I'm going to have the same constant, of course, in the numerator that I had before, so negative 3. And then remember that I need s plus something here. Well, remember that's the root being negative 6 means my factor in the quadratic will be s plus 6. So it's very important to remember that. Okay, um, So I have s plus 6, and then I will have s plus 10. Not plus a negative 10, but plus 10. Okay, And again, if you're not sure, just multiply that out, and you'll see that, indeed, I get uh, s squared plus 6s plus 10s would be 16s plus the 60. So you see, if I put minus signs there, I would not get the original expression. And that's why you always have to go, um, you know, s minus this value. Okay, so we'll check that. And that is correct. That was the first step. And now it wants you to do a partial fraction expansion. Again, it's not asking for g of t here. So if I were entering time domain values, those would necessarily be rejected because they're not what's being asked for in the question. So um, to do a partial fraction expansion, I will need two fractions. So I'll put in a fraction term plus a second fraction term. Again, I can just click on that, and it'll put it in successively. Or I can drag them either way. Um, if you 
put something that's not correct, you can just drag it out, and then you can always enter another one. Okay, so now I'll put a constant in the numerator of each expression for my partial fraction expansion. And in the denominator, I'll have s plus a. And I need two of those. And my a values, of course, will be 6 and 10, as in the original expression here. Okay, so again, those are the two things that get multiplied to make this original denominator. Now I need to put in the constants in the numerator. Um, and again, the goal is to make it such that if I add this up over a common denominator, that I will have the original expression. So that's how I can check my answers uh, when I'm done. So to find this first coefficient, I'll use the method of residues, otherwise known maybe as the thumb method. So I'll multiply through here by s plus 6, the entire equation, and then set s equal to negative 6. So when I multiply this by s plus 6 and set s equal to negative 6, I'm basically multiplying that by 0. So that just goes away entirely, which is what we want, because that'll leave us with nothing but this term on the right-hand side. So then when I go back to here and multiply by s plus 6, that cancels that s plus 6 factor. Now when I set s equal to negative 6, I have negative 6 plus 10, which is 4. And so I'll have negative 3 fourths, or negative uh, 0.75. Now don't try to enter that as a fraction. Circuit Tutor does not accept fractions in the answer, so you need to type that as an actual number. Um, let's see, did I forgot the minus sign there? So it's negative uh, uh, 0.75. Now for the other constant, um, I'm going to do a similar procedure. So I'm going to multiply through the entire expression by s plus 10 and then set s equal to negative 10. And that will similarly cancel out this term entirely and isolate the constant here. So when I multiply times s plus 10 here, that cancels the s plus 10. I could put my finger over it if I wish. And then um, setting s equal to negative 10 in the remainder, I have negative 10 plus 6. So that will be negative 4. So negative 3 divided by negative 4. Now that's going to be plus 0.75 for this coefficient. Okay, so that should be the partial fraction expansion that's being requested here. So I'll check that. And that is correct. Okay, so now the third and final step here is to enter the actual inverse transform in the time domain. So again, pay attention to what it's asking for. So now I will need time domain terms, which means I need to go over this other palette of terms that actually have t in them. Obviously, the time domain involves the variable time. Okay, so now I will remember that, hopefully, that the inverse transform of 1 over s plus a is just e to the negative at times the unit step function. If for any reason you don't remember that, you can always look it up in the Laplace transforms table, which is given here. That would correspond to this entry in that table. But again, I do recommend memorizing these first three entries. Okay, so we will need two exponential terms, each with its own constant. And also we need the unit step function. Now we could use just one unit step function by using this bracket term, if you like. Um, I'm just going to do it as two separate terms here for convenience. So I have k um, times the exponential times the unit step function. And then I need to add another similar term, so it'll be plus k times the exponential times the unit step function. Okay, so the first coefficient then, I'll just enter the values, would be negative 0.75. And then, because it's 1 over s plus 6, that corresponds to e to the negative 6t, so I'll enter that. And then the second one, the coefficient will be 0.75. And then I'll have e to the negative 10t, because it's 1 over s plus a is 10. So that'll be e to the negative 10t. So that completes the expression, and I have no red boxes indicating anything that's still blank. So I'll just check that, and that is correct. And now it does show me a brief summary of uh, the work that I did there. Um, if you want to see all the details again, if you're uncertain about any step, then you can always click this new detailed solution, and that will actually show you all the process, even including how to do the uh, quadratic formula in the standard form here. Um, which is the form that I recommend you use because it's a little bit more direct than the form you may have used in elementary algebra. Okay, so um, that completes... That completes the medium level in Circuit Tutor, and that is the end of this uh, demonstration.